Michael Wolf, uh, I'm very, very delighted, very happy and excited to have you today on the Making It Real podcast. Michael is a serial entrepreneur who created an amazing uh, success story in the entrepreneurship world. He did just not start one company, but different ones as well. He was entrepreneur in residence for some of the premier funds that we have in the US and as well here in Europe. Uh, so Michael, so glad to have you on the show. Um, very interested in how you actually got started your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, so thanks for asking, and thanks for, and it's great to see you again. Um, I've seen Jan in both in person and on Zoom off and on for the last, um, I think since I lived in Barcelona about six years ago. So um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me on. Um, I, think, I think for me, I, I'm, I'm kind of fortunate in that my timing and my geography were super favorable because I, I was at Stanford, graduated in the um, early 90s. Um, and just when you're, when you're here, you're just surrounded by other people starting companies. You're surrounded by these great success stories. So I kind of ended up in a place where, you know, I was not the kind of kid who had a paper route or like was a hustler growing up. Like I was not super entrepreneurial. But I think when I got to California, I grew up mostly on the East Coast in the United States. Um, just being in a place where these new companies were being born and seeing people that look like me, people who had technical degrees, people who were in their 20s doing these things makes you realize that you can do it too. And I spent the first few years of my career actually on Wall Street. I was in New York for a few years and then London for a year working for Goldman Sachs. Came back to California after about three years. And that, that was 1994, which is when the dot-com explosion really started to happen. Joined my first startup as the first employee in 94, which was a web analytics company and ended up running kind of half the engineering team there. Great company, grew quickly, ended up getting acquired. I then joined a company called Kana, also as the first employee, ran engineering, huge you know, IPO, big success, got to up 100 million in revenue. And that's really when I said, hey, you know, when a startup works, it's really, really fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an adventure, it's a wild ride. You make friendships and professional relationships that can last kind of well beyond the company. Then I started a company after that called Bontu, which was an information security company, also a big success, um, got acquired by Symantec, and I spent a couple of years as an executive at Symantec, started a company after that as a founder and CEO, which was really my one big failure. That was a company that kind of started at the wrong time, never really nailed the product market fit, you kind of couldn't figure out who our customer was, took some time off and spent a year in Barcelona, then came back and started Gladly in 2014, which is what I'm working on now. And right now I'm running the product team at Gladly. Mm -hmm. Super exciting to see all this, you know, hardly you know, normally people start one company and they're almost <laughs> like done for life. You, you keep going at it you know, and have this really amazing success. So maybe we have many people as well that work maybe in more financial jobs or in business. How was this mm -hmm. transition from kind of this business world, you said Goldman Sachs into actually the technology world? Yeah, and that, you know, it's going to be it's going to be different for for everybody. I, I think that um, especially if you're joining, uh, I, I think a couple things. I think that jo there's so much focus on founding a company, and all you hear is about founders and ideas and co-founders. I think that joining a startup is underrated. I think there's a lot of folks where if you want to get into the startup world, especially if you're coming maybe from a different field or maybe if you don't have a technical background going and finding like a really great 10 or 20 person company and saying, I'm going to jump on this rocket ship, learn as much as I can. If the company works, I'll have a success, which makes it easier than to do, do my own company. And even if it doesn't, I'll have the network, I'll have the knowledge. I might have some contacts with the board or the investors. I would say that that's always a great path. I'd never say that if somebody has an idea for a company and is ready to go now, I would say, do it. But I would say if you don't, you know, getting into the startup world, working for somebody else is a great transition. Also, if you want to be in the startup world, I think you have to really understand, you have to look at job descriptions, look at how these companies operate, which is why I think it's so valuable to join one. And really understand if you're, especially if you're a kind of a business track, um, not, 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 a, not a designer engineer, you, you, know, you need to be great at something. You need to be able to go to a company and say, this is what I bring. I am great at generating leads and getting you into companies and getting, you know, get, get, getting meetings with companies to, to, to pitch your On product. the sales side. And yeah, I'm great at sales. I'm great at content marketing. I'm great at growth hacking. 
you have to have a discipline that you either are really good at or at least have a plausible path to get in very good at. And generally that's not going to be like strategy or biz dev or finance or kind of like MBA type background. It's going to be more, hey, you're either helping me sell the product or you're helping me build the product. And I think whether you're joining a startup or founding a company, really getting great, really having kind of a go-to skill, which is the, the thing that you bring to that company that you can rely on. And then you have to build a lot of skills around that. But really having that, you know, having that thing that is, hey, if I join your company, this is the skill that I bring, and then I can build on that. Mm -hmm. And when you basically left Goldman Sachs, you joined these companies, then the first two quite early, almost first employed in which almost yeah. is like a founding role as well. Mm -hmm. Is that a good, no, it's almost as well, in, I guess in a way very scary because you don't know how well the company will do. It's really the early, early days. Yeah. Is that the best time in, in terms of learning really join very, very early? Or is that like when they are 10, 20 or so? What, any uh, suggestions? I mean, it, it, it was for me because I think the earlier you join, the more learning you get. But you only get that learning if the company actually goes somewhere. And there's very few two and three and four person companies that ever actually find product market fit and then grow a pipeline, get a bunch of customers, raise venture capital. So if you join the right company, I think the earlier you join, the better because you get to see all the different phases of a company. But if you go and pick a tiny startup and join it, the risk, you know, the failure rate's really high. There's a very good chance that a year from now you're going to be back out looking for another role. So I think you have to kind of, you really have to figure out what your risk reward profile is. It's almost like being an investor. You know, think about, think if you were an angel investor, venture capitalist, I can see that. Yeah. how do you get a tiny company that hasn't started to sell their product yet and know if that's the one to bet on? Very few people can do that. So that might, you might be better off waiting until a company has 10 or 15 people maybe has a couple customers and is starting to grow, then you, you probably have a little higher likelihood of being able to live through that couple years of growth, which is, I think is where a lot of the learning happens. That being said, I think if you find a company to join that is the right fit for you, the right people, I, I've never said, I wouldn't overthink it too much. I wouldn't say, you know, between joining a company at three employees, 10 employees, 20 employees, if it's a great fit, you should probably do it. How did that actually work out in your uh, situation? Because there's so many exciting startups that I imagine back in the mid nineties and in, in, in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, why that company? Were you actually looking at that at the founders and really doing some kind of like evaluation on that? Looking yeah. At different companies? Yeah. I, I, w I wish I had, I, I wish I could tell you that I had some company picking ability. Um, I really don't think I necessarily do. That's part of why I've never become a venture capitalist like that, that ability to look at a hundred companies and say, this is the one that's going to get big. I think that's a, that's a little bit of a different skill set than being a founder or being a good operator. I think for me, it was always people. It's always been, and, and this is kind of the framework within, I kind of look at the startup world, whether you're starting a company or joining the company, is what is the set of people you want to work with? And hopefully it's people you already know because they're, you went to school with them or they're coming from another company where you worked. But if it's, or you might be joining that, that team of people for the first time, I think you should always say, am I joining a company or am I starting a company or am I getting myself into a situation where I'm with people who, even if this company doesn't work out, they're going to bring me into their next company or I'm going to bring them into my next company. And for me, my first company was folks, was folks I knew in school, either firsthand, secondhand. A bunch of folks from my first company went to become founders and early at the second company. Um, a lot of those folks ended up at the third company. And one, one place I got lucky is that Benchmark invested in my second company, the Benchmark Capital, the venture firm. Then I became an entrepreneur in, in residence there. Then they funded my third company and my fourth company. Then I also got, then I all, and my, my co-founder gladly is a partner at Greylock. So then Greylock actually incubated the fifth company. So it's not just the people you work with. It's asking, do I have advisors, investors, board members who I've built a relationship with who I can also, they can also bring me into the next thing or I can bring them into the next thing. So I've always seen this as a journey where the first thing, whether it works or not, you're building kind of a community, you're building a network of people who you enjoy working with, who, who can do the things, you know, who, who do, do, the, do the things you need them to do or you can do the things they need. Then that can kind of translate to the next one. 
that's why I think you always have to make sure that even if you're, even if the company is not working, those relationships are really strong because if this one doesn't work, it's going to be the next one. Mm -hmm. Which I think as well is uh, fantastic news for people that are wait, uh, afraid to fail, because here basically mm -hmm. you see as well, even if one venture fails, if you were strong people, you're about to yeah. start the next venture right away then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I, it's almost like a form of capital. I hate to call it capital because you know, these, are, these are sometimes great personal relationships. Mm -hmm. But if you get with some great people and you learn from them, they learn from you, and then you're on the journey together and they may all end up at different companies or you might bring them to your next company. It, that's not a failure. That's a success because you're in, like you, you've now built up a network of folks who are going to go on and do great things. And you know, that it makes everything a lot easier. Mm -hmm. What is oftentimes tricky, however, that when you are at the very beginning is to figure out the ones that you're maybe joining as an employee or that you co-found with, are they really great? Are they good? Yeah, are they yeah, really great, yeah. right? Do you have any framework, any suggestion for people how to figure out if the co-founder, the potential uh, mm -hmm. recruit that, or the, the founder of a company that I might want to join is really great? Yeah, it's really hard. And I think, you know, even, even professional venture capitalists will tell you that their hit rate is, is not that great. Um, I'm a really big believer in references. I think if, if, you, if you, whether you're interviewing somebody or whether they're interviewing you and you're, and you're making a decision about whether you should join that company, almost anybody can really impress you in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, especially if it's somebody who's really good at sales and somebody who's great at kind of pitching their company. Um, that's a good starting point. Obviously, if, if you if you're if you're joining a company or if you're pitching an investor, that ability to grab them and get them excited, like you need that as a founder. But it really comes down to who have they worked with in the past? Did they leave? You know, not only were they successful, but did they leave good relationships? Can you check some references? I think the best references are typically references that somebody doesn't give you. So, for example, if I were if I were being interviewed by somebody to join a company. I would really work hard to figure out who we knew in common, find out what that working relationship was like, you know, get some references. And I think that means if you're looking for a job or even if you're looking for investors, leaving that time to say, I'm not just going to go by that first interview or I'm not just going to pick the first thing I find, really do your diligence, find people you know in common, get some backdoor references and really get a full picture of what you're getting into. When it's it's hard to do when it's early because a lot of if somebody's a year you know just out of school they're not going to have they're not going to necessarily have the track record, but I think there's almost always some evidence outside of that conversation that you can go get and say hey does I got a good first impression but does the rest of their network and the things they've done in the past does it back that up? Mm -hmm. Which as well is really amazing as well to see there's always a kind of a close community then whatever you do as well and there are mm -hmm. always some connections there. In, uh, yeah. in that regard. Um, when you then said, okay, you, you, you went through this amazing growth story and then you said, oh, now I want to be a founder myself. I imagine as well, it's quite kind of a scary decision to do, right? Because on mm -hmm. the one side, yeah. it's like somebody else in the end is kind of like taking the lead, has to make sure that financing is coming in and all of that. What was kind of like a triggering moment for you to say, no, no, I, I want to create my own company. Can I be that, <laughs> I, you know, uh, help somebody else yeah. with the company? Yeah, so, so I was really early at two companies in a row, which I think helps build a lot of confidence in terms of, hey, I, I kind of know how to do this. I co-founded my third company with Joseph Antonelli, who's also my co-founder at my fifth company, who, and who's been the CEO of my companies, and just a great founder, also a great investor. He was a partner at Greylock when we, when we uh, started Gladly. So I think, first of all, finding your people, getting a co-founder or two that you're really simpatico with, that you kind of that, that gives you the confidence that you're not in this on your own. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say don't be a solo founder if you really have the right opportunity and if you don't have a natural co-founder, but I think if you can start a company with a co-founder, that confidence that, Hey, this is going to be hard, but we're going to help and I have somebody to go to, we, you know, we, we have, you know, kind of have each other's backs. I think that helps a lot. I think the second thing that helps is going into a space that, you know, going into something where you either have sold into that market before or you've sold into something similar, maybe it's adjacent, but some of the patterns are the same and where maybe you've worked on similar products or you can easily find people who have. I think you, you know, on the one hand, you, if you start a company, you don't just want to do the exact same thing that you or somebody else 
already did or else that's not a great startup idea because every good idea has a lot of originality to it. But I think jumping into something where you're totally unfamiliar and where you don't have um, a lot of background or you haven't done something like it before is also very difficult. So I think the going into a situation where you, you're comfortable with some of it, but you're very uncomfortable with a lot of it is kind of a good, it's kind of a good sweet spot. It's, it's, I, I think, and, and this is true, whether you're joining a company, starting a company, understanding that balance of comfort, to discomfort, I should have a lot of discomfort or else I'm probably not doing something really new and interesting and risky, but there should be a couple places I have some confidence and comfort that I at least know how to do some of this based on some previous experiences. So I think you always need to get out of your comfort zone, but you're, you have to judge how far out of your comfort zone you want to get. Mm -hmm. In terms of process, how to start these companies, no, you have been an entrepreneur in residence, which often, mm -hmm. oftentimes they work with processes, I imagine. Um, would you say you're following a process? Yeah, I, I don't think um, they're, 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 they've all been pretty different. I think that there is a, there's kind of two parallel processes. I think there's a company building process. There is, should we raise money? When should we raise money? Who should we hire? There's kind of the, how do I build a team of people to go along on the ride to make these things work? And I think that, um, Especially if you're, if you can raise venture capital or if you're in a startup hub like San Francisco, you know, or Berlin or London or, you know, places where there's other startups, I think that company building playbook is there. You can find people who have done it. You can read blogs. You can bring in advisors. So that's one track. The other track is really the product market fit track. It's really, have we found the right, the right customer? Have we, do they have a problem they'll pay for? Do we have a solution that solves that problem? That one is a lot less predictable. There's, and there's less of a playbook for that. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great content. You can read Lean Startup. You can read like all these, all these, all these things you can do to validate ideas. But I think generally you just have to, and my companies have all been B2B software, I should have mentioned earlier. So there's always a buyer. There's always somebody you can go and ask, would you buy this product? I'll, the, the main thing we've done, I wouldn't call it a specific methodology like Lean Startup, but it's just you start selling from day one. The very first, you know, even before you start your company, get in front of customers, show them, even if it's just a screenshot or a demo or a prototype, anything that they can look at and react to, you sell it. And then they'll say, well, that's interesting. If it had this, I'd be interested. Or, hey, I saw something like that yesterday. Or if you delivered this, I could then, you know, go and do a project. Then you come back, then you keep coming back, then you keep coming back. And eventually those discovery sessions turn into your beta customers, essentially. You keep building, you get them live on the beta. Eventually, though, then eventually those beta customers become your first production customers. Then you make them referenceable, use those happy customers to build your next generation. But it always involves getting in front of the customers really early. This idea you spend a year building it, then the second year you sell it. You don't do that. You spend the first year building it and selling it, and eventually those two things will come together. Co-development with the customers. How, how do you find that when you don't have really reference customers? And maybe you said uh, talked about the advantage of starting in an industry that you know. I assume in some ventures mm -hmm. you knew them already from previous companies or so. But generally speaking, for people that maybe don't have that strong of ties in the market, how <laughs> could they find the first customers? Yeah, it's 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 very hard. It's the hardest thing. And if you ask, if you go ask ten startups uh, what their biggest challenges are, or if you ask ten startups that failed why they failed, almost all of them will say they couldn't build a pipeline, couldn't find interested customers, couldn't get into companies. And again, I'm talking more B two B, which is my which is what I know. And the truth is that uh, a couple things. First, if you're having trouble getting getting meetings and getting into customers when you start your company, you're gonna have just as much trouble a year later. Meaning the fact that maybe you have a working product or something doesn't, you, you still need to be able to sell and you still need to have a reason why people will take meetings with you and you still have to have that hustle to get those meetings. So you may as well start early because it's not gonna get any easier. And in fact, part of what makes you a great founder is your ability to do that. And it's really, and I'm not, I'm not great at this. I've always had other people at the company who took, who took point more on this. It's just a lot of heavy lifting. It is, you use LinkedIn, 
you go through networks, you go to, you go to trade shows, you follow people on Twitter. You, it, it's all that kind of hustling you need to do. Which, by the way, you would, even if you were five years into the company, you still need to do a lot of those same things. It never gets easy to get people into your, your pipeline. There's some specific tactics though in how you approach people where if I'm starting a company or, let, or, or I get pitches on LinkedIn all the time, as I'm sure you do. And if, if I get a pitch that says, hey, my product's great, buy it, I'm gonna ignore that. If I get a pitch that says, hey, I'm a founder doing discovery, would love to get your feedback, I'd love to get some help on you know, kind of evolving this product in this market, I might respond to that because that's really interesting. Yeah. And if I'm a buyer at a big company, I get people, I get sales pitches all day long, but getting a discovery pitch, which is, hey, you're a smart person in this industry, I'd love your feedback, I love that stuff. And you'd be surprised how interested customers actually are in, in pairing with startups and saying, hey, I wish this product existed. I'd love to help make it happen and I'd love to give you advice. So people are a lot more receptive, I think, than people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, you're often, uh, often more focused on, well, engineer by training, so kind of CTO roles or head of mm -hmm. product and uh, leading the product development. Yeah. Any, any advice for people then? that receive now this customer feedback, they show them the user interface, what the product could look like, they talk about features, so how do you determine actually this, you know, often called minimal viable product or the first launch product and how to kind of stack the features and how to come up with these questions, like is it just a feature or a full product? Like how do you think about product? What would framework or so do you use for that? Yeah, that's, um, you know, that's a really tough, and it's gonna, it's gonna vary by market, but that, that's a really tough question. I, I think that, Every company is founded with some thesis, like there's a reason you're doing what you're doing. You should evolve that thesis as you discover things about it that are more correct or less correct. But ultimately, there's a reason you're doing what you're doing. And if the reason you're in a market or working on a product is you think you can build something a tiny bit better with a couple extra features or you know a couple dollars cheaper, those kind of companies never succeed anyway. That's not, that's not where startups come from. What you're validating when you interview customers is this shift you see in the market where something that didn't have a software solution in the past now could have a software solution if you brought it to cloud or mobile or whatever the platform shift you're betting on. Or there's a particular approach that you know is going to be five times, ten times better than the legacy competitors, which is really what my company is doing. Um, you just need to validate, you, you need to keep validating that thesis. And you, you get that initial validation just by showing mock-ups and demos and kind of the early stuff I talked about earlier. Ultimately, you need to get someone to agree to buy it. And if they see something that's so different and better that they're willing to buy it and maybe doesn't have every feature every competitor has, that that's really strong validation. You're on the right track. And the place you need to put your um, investment dollars in terms of building the product on all, are, is on that set of things that's new and different. If you end up, if you find yourself just copying a long feature list that every other product in the market has, then you're probably not doing something that's new and different enough that it's a good startup idea in the first place. So you really need to kind of focus on that, okay, the reason we started this company, the thing we thought was missing in the market was this, let's put our investment dollars into this, and if customers still don't buy it, then it could be the entire thesis was wrong. But if you find yourself, you know, fighting a feature war, then that's probably not a great idea either. So oftentimes what uh, startup founders kind of are confronted with, they, they have a vision around something, they want to create a, a product that is differentiated or so, but they're really struggling as well with these me too features or these standard mm -hmm. features that at times exist in the market. They have very yeah. limited constraints and they wonder which features should they actually develop. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem. I think, you know, every, every B2B company struggles with that. I think that there, there's, really two, two, um, there's really two reasons B2B startups are founded. And I think one, and you need to know which one you are. I think one is that you're solving a problem that is a new problem. It didn't exist before. Or you're bringing software into a kind of a market that hasn't had software. Meaning the thing you're validating is that people will buy a product in this market meaning the problem is compelling enough that software can now solve that problem. My, my third company, Vontu, the, the security company, that's what we were doing. We were basically trying to establish 
a new market. It was a, you know, what, what venture capitalists will call like zero dollar market going on a billion, meaning it's a new market. So the risk you're taking is market risk, in which case your validation is really, is it a big enough problem that you would spend money on it? And if we built this product, would that solve it well enough that, that you would, you could get budget and buy the product? The second one is that you're in a you're in a market that's competitive, but you're bringing a completely different approach to that market. For example, you're taking something that was on premise and you're moving it to software as a service, or you're leveraging mobile, or you're leveraging cloud, or some or like Snowflake's kind of being, that 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 that's moving something that was a lot of complex on premise infrastructure to the cloud. In which case, you are going to have to build some supporting features. You are going to have to build the core features that that market needs. But you should continue to get feedback that the core proposition you're bringing, which is, okay, you know, like, our, like my company, for example, is bringing together lots of things that existed in disparate systems into a single place, moving it to the cloud, which then unlocks a bunch of other functionality. If we go into a customer who says, yeah, that's okay, but we also need these 100 features, we're probably not talking to a customer that's an early adopter or someone who's innovative enough that they would go with the startup anyway. If we talk to a customer who says, wow, that's exactly the way it should work, super excited. But before I get budget, I just need these three things because you know our business runs on those things. That probably is a good customer and you probably should bring, you should, probably should build those three things because the next is gonna need the same things too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. There's some discussion as well around, should you actually charge these customers, these early customers for, for, or not for basically the product that you are co-developing and how much yeah. should you charge them? Any, like what's your personal take on that? Yeah, I honestly don't have a lot of great experience doing that. You know, my, my, my companies, it's, these early meetings have generally been validation sessions. It's been, are we on the right track? Then it turns into, okay, would like you to try it and buy it, where it's been more of a pilot. It's maybe been a 30-day pilot, and then if it works, they're going to buy it. Um, there are markets where people have successfully charged for pilots. My companies have never done it because that overhead of trying to get a little bit of money for a pilot it adds enough friction that you might not get the pilot in the first place. And so often the goal of the pilot is to give you a business case and give you the results that justify the budget for the larger deal. So you don't want to do a bunch of work for free. If, if you don't think, if a customer can't give you a verbal, like if this pilot's successful, I believe I can get budget and do something. You probably don't want to do it. But you also don't want to put a little, hey, we want 5K for a pilot, 10K for a pilot that then keeps those pilots from happening because now you're asking the person to go and get budget, which could take months, even if it's something small, then you add friction and don't win the deal anyway. So you wanna reduce friction, but you don't wanna, um, but all the way along the way though, you have to continue to validate, like, will you buy it if this pilot works? You know, will you buy it if we build it? Okay, we built it. Will you buy it if the pilot's successful? Yes. You can certainly, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Right, no, no, right. I think that's fantastic insights. Not to really uh, connect it always. As to say, even you don't have to sell the whole solution to get the full, let's say, financial commitment that comes with a, yeah. a, a substantial, let's say, enterprise B two B software. But saying, okay, we start a pilot, but the joint understanding needs to be then that this will transition into obviously then if the pilot is successful and so into a, yeah. you know, an existing yeah. relationship that has the normal. I assume yep. normal rates of pricing. How do you think about pricing for startups? Should they kind of give discounts? Is it okay to give yes. discounts for the first three, four customers or so? Or? Yeah, I, I think that if you, there's certain things that if you're, and again, if you're, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little more of an enterprise focus where it's a little bit of a larger deal size, which means there's a person at the company who's going to have to get a budget, get it approved and go, you're going to go through more of an enterprise buying process. I'm not talking about the 40 nine dollar put it on your credit card market which is also a great way to start a company it's just just one i don't have as much experience in i think that your first say five or ten customers where you really need somebody who's willing to take a risk you really need somebody who can become a reference to get you those next set of customers you might need them to become a reference so you can then raise venture capital because investors always want to see early success i think you can do all kinds of unnatural acts to get those to get those folks as customers i think that um, even early on when you're doing the validation saying okay you guys can become a development partner we'll give you a discount because it's an early product and we're going to ask a lot of time from you mm -hmm. on feedback and then you know and then doing that with a few customers 
I think that's totally natural. I think that's a great way to get a company started. You might get less revenue, but just the fact they're paying you and the fact they're spending time with you and they're on track to become a referenceable customer, I think that's, that's the right investment. Once you get beyond that, if you are, if you find that the only way you win deals is by discounting, that's not a great startup strategy. You know, generally startups are, and often, often they're building premium products where they might even be charging more than the competitors because the differentiation is so great and the, com- and the customers are ultimately saving money by using you even if they're paying more. So I think getting a company started, there's all kinds of tactics that are kind of things that don't scale, which is always the, the thing you hear Y Combinator say. You spend a lot of time with those customers. You give them discounts. You build personal relationships. That doesn't scale to a thousand customers. First five or ten, you should do that. After that, you should really feel like you're converging on the pricing that um, that you're going for, because if you're only winning deals by being cheaper than the competitor, that's usually a dead end and not a great way to start a software company. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. What other kind of mistakes, and if we say the top three or so mistakes that you see founders make typically when they start, especially in B2B enterprise type of software companies? Yeah, I think the first one is they underestimate the people side of it. I think they really, um, now, now, now as a founder, you should expect to do a lot. I mean, you should expect, you know, you and your founding team, you're going to have to get the meetings you're going to have to close the deals. You shouldn't expect that you're going to hire um, salespeople super early at a startup. You need to do the product validation and you need to raise money. But once you get to say, you know, five or 10, 15, 20, all the success of the company is based on who you hire. So who's going to run that sales team and close those deals? You know, who are the engineers and the designers, product managers who are going to build the product? And I think most founders give up or they give up control too slowly. They don't bring in really senior people. If they do, they're really slow to hand off things to them. They feel like, hey, nobody can design this product the way I can design it. Nobody can sell it the way I can sell it, which then makes it harder to hire good people. It's harder to scale. So I think that it, founders often have to get a bunch of people at their company doing things they used to do so that it slows them down on on the team building. I think the other thing founders get tripped up on is, um, I call it like the shark tank philosophy. It's this idea that what's important early is finding a bunch of investors who you can impress and pitch them and they'll give you money. And that getting the investor to bless you and bless your idea is like the, it's like graduating, it's, I don't know, it's like graduating goal, high school. Almost, um, it, it's like the thing that says you're on the right track. It's the thing that says your company is legitimate. The reality is, is that if you build a great company, you're going to find investors. Now you do need investors because raising this, this stuff is really expensive. So another, another mistake I think founders make is they think they're not going to need to raise money or they raise too little. But you probably will need to raise money. But the way you raise money is to have a great team, great product, customers, now, you do need to be great at pitching your company, finding investors, but I think too many founders, they think, okay, my first thing I need to do is find like a Mark Cuban who's going to say, you're legitimate and here's some money, and then like that's the goal, and that's more of a tactic. Like you need great partners, but that's just like a step along the way. That's not the, okay, you know, until somebody says I can start my company, until somebody tells me it's a good idea and gives me money, it's not real. Like that's not how it works. That's why I don't actually like the Shark Tank type shows because they give the impression that the co- the show is called Shark Tank. Like the focus yeah, is on yeah. the investors. It should be on the founders. The investors are you know along for the ride. That's a wonderful perspective actually as well, and uh, really as yes. well. I think I always say money follows. That should uh, <laughs> focus on first building a company venture, and then it follows automatically. You know, if you have yeah. traction, especially in these days as well, yeah. don't get confused that it's not about chasing the money and I think it's wonderful how you highlight that the shark <laughs> and, the, and all these these shows we have similar ones in Germany and now in the UK as well and so um, yeah they, they might portray that the wrong picture what it's all about in the startup world no? um, yeah, yeah. for people that are now struggling with this question well should I start a company or so do you have any advice on that one so we have many people now that aspire to be entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and now they hear really valuable tips on how to get started what would be, you, what could you see as the ultimate thing that could maybe people help decide? Yeah, should I now do it or should I just like do whatever I'm doing right now? Yeah, I um, 
I always get in trouble when I use analogies, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think that's a little bit like asking, should I get married? I think that if you say, I want to get married, and you go out in the street and talk to 10 people, pick your favorite one and get married, um, you're probably not going to have a great marriage because that marriage wasn't based off of this is a person I want to spend the rest of my life with. Therefore, we're going to get married. Meaning going into it with becoming a founder is the goal. And then you'll like go and look for ideas, look for co-founders and hopefully come up with something that doesn't work very often. Usually when you hear successful founder stories, it's there was a market I was really into. There was a problem I was really into. There was a team I really wanted to work with that led to this, that led to founding a company that led to raising money, meaning it's a more natural organic process. So I think the, if you're just sitting in your room and say, you know, being a founder sounds fun. I'm going to go be a founder. Um, you should probably give yourself a few years. And like I said earlier, I think even joining a startup and getting to know that world and getting into it might be a better path than just kind of going out and finding an idea. But if there's a specific thing you want to work on and you're dying to work on it, then you know the market. And now there's still a lot of risk and things you need to figure out, but it, the best companies tend to be a little more organic. I'd say in that case, I'd never tell somebody, wait till you have more experience, wait till you're older, wait till you have a co-founder. I think if you are, if you're dying to start your company and you can kind of see it, you can kind of see the thing you're trying to do. I would never say don't do it. But if you think starting a company is like go getting, go, going and getting a job as a banker and you just need to apply to a bunch of incubators and come up with a plausible idea, that's usually not, not where great companies come from. So I'd probably give a little bit more time to understand the world you're getting into. Wonderful. I think this is really great advice. Now, I think this is well perfect way you know, to come back as well to the uh, first part that we said. At times, it's good to just then join a company as well if you want to mm -hmm. be in the entrepreneurship space. And then yeah. almost naturally, might, things might happen. And, and you really know it when you're working on a specific project that you really want to go all in. You know, and there's no questions yeah. even that, that you should go all in. Yeah. Um, any additional advice or so that you'd like to give at this point to potential founders or think about start, uh, creating a company or the ones that are on their way and struggling yeah. a bit here and there? Yeah, I would, I would, um, I don't know if this is especially practical advice, but I think it's just something I think founders forget is, you know, the, the reason all this is supposedly to have a better life, meaning the reason you are starting a company versus joining a big company or the reason you're in this market, not that market is because you really see something you're passionate to work on. You probably want to make some money along the way. You probably want to work with great people. And I think sometimes founders forget that, you know, work-life balance is super important. Your relationships are important, staying healthy, exercising. And in fact, those things are actually really good for your startup. Meaning if the, if the founder is stressed and unhealthy and unhappy, the whole team is going to end up that way and the company's probably going to fail. So I think always having that perspective of, of why am I doing this? You know, it, and if I'm successful, what do I have? What do I get? You know, where, where will I be? I think that that not only will give you better work-life balance, keep you healthier, make you more likely to succeed. I think it also is, um, it's part of how you, like I said earlier, it's part of how you get that set of people to come along for the ride with you. You know, if you have a short-term success where you work people to death 100 hours a week, then the whole thing falls apart two years later not only is the company not going to be successful, you're not going to have built those relationships and built kind of a sustainable career. I've always thought of this as a career where you, if you, you know, first of all, take care of yourself personally, really focus on your business, expect to work super hard, but don't work hard at the expense of the reason we're doing this in the first place, which is to have a good life, good relationships. I think you both end up with better results and you don't end up with this trade-off where you have a successful company but a miserable personal life. Like I really do think you can have both. I wouldn't set up that false, that false dichotomy where to be successful, you have to be miserable. Cause I really like, I'm not miserable and I've never have been. And I don't think, you, I don't think you need to be, but I do think you need to be super focused, work super hard and do a lot of difficult things along the way. And you shouldn't expect being a founder to be a glamorous lifestyle because it's not, it's, it's just a constant grind. But if you're working on the right idea with the right people, every moment might not be fun but you'll go home at the end of the week with that satisfaction of I solved some hard problems, did some hard things, and you know, my team is better off for it. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing these wonderful insights. All the best <laughs> going forward, and uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Okay, appreciate it, Jan.